Before I move on, I'd like to just show you where you can read a little bit more about Butler. Um, and um, there is a short video. Again, I don't want to waste too much time, um, but I wanted to just say, whoops, sorry, my computer is lagging because once again, I have too many things open. Um, so uh, Octavia Butler's biography is something, again, the links I'm going to share, um, but I just, I wanted to start by introducing her as a female black writer um, who I think created a lot of change in the way people perceive science fiction. So that's why I think um, she's a very significant author. Okay, Sahar, we'll talk more about, yeah, yeah, I understand. Yep, I'll comment on sources. We're gonna talk about APA citation today. Okay, so here's just a little snippet. Um, can you guys hear the sound? The question, the issue of people just trusting each other, and that, that being kind of what leads to so much of the evil in the world was at the heart of a lot of what she wrote. As a child, she said she wanted to be a writer, and they said, you can't be a writer. Black women aren't writers. Harlan Ellison told me that there was a student whom he had taught at a Los Angeles workshop, Octavia E. Butler, and indeed, she was really quite extraordinary. And it became very clear very quickly that when she had something to say, she said it. In these stories, you've got people dealing with the usual extraordinary things that you see in science fiction and fantasy. But in this case, she had realistic people dealing with this in realistic ways. The aliens are here, and yet we're still fighting amongst ourselves because a man doesn't want to listen to a woman. Humankind has to learn. Sorry, guys, you cannot uh, you cannot see the video. Okay, let me reshare. Ugh, why does it do that? Bull distrusting each other and that that being kind of what leads to so much of the evil in the world was at the heart of a lot of what she wrote as a child she said she wanted to be a writer and they said you can't be a writer black women aren't writers Harlan Ellison told me that there was a student whom he had taught at a Los Angeles workshop, Octavia E. Butler, and indeed, she was really quite extraordinary. And it became very clear very quickly that when she had something to say, she said it. In these stories, you've got people dealing with the usual extraordinary things that you see in science fiction and fantasy. But in this case, she had realistic people dealing with this in realistic ways. The aliens are here, and yet we're still fighting amongst ourselves because a man doesn't want to listen to a woman. Humankind has to learn to overcome its instinctive reaction to difference in order to interact with these aliens. The aliens are like, look, I'm different. I know that's freaking you out. Deal with it. You read it, you know, it's, it's, you, you walk around for the next few days thinking about it, which is what I think good writing makes you do. Her stories really weren't about aliens or vampires or psionics. They were about people. And they were about all the ways that people are alien to themselves. She was using that one step removed to turn a mirror on us. And I'm glad that she actually was willing to hold up that mirror and say, look at how horrible we are. Let's not be that bad. That's it. Um, so, uh, as I said, there's a whole website dedicated. You can look at uh, more um, biographical information. But what I want to highlight is that um, born and raised in California, as I said, despite the fact that that's a more much more progressive state now, she faced a lot of racism. And she began to write uh, from a very young age of 10 years. Um, according to her, to escape boredom. Uh, there were certainly no uh, YouTube or Netflix channels back then. Uh, she wrote to entertain herself. Uh, it sounds like uh, Margaret Atwood's story as well. There's not much to do, so she did a lot of reading and writing. And um, 
she lost her dad when she was young so she was raised by her mom um who had to work as a maid to make enough money to support her self and her daughter um so when blood blood child was published in 1984 um she uh, was already recognized as um, uh, an author of significance, um, but Blood Child specifically uh, won both Hugo and Nebula awards for science fiction, which are like the biggest uh, accolades for science fiction. And, um, and so basically um, she, you know, her career took off after that. Um, but uh, I think, again, and you can look at some more um, uh, interesting uh, biographical information, she really, as an African American woman, uh, you know, so sort of a minority in several ways, um, she changed the way people viewed what good science fiction could be as the video suggested and there's the link to it again um she wrote about human problems but uh the human problems were depicted through these these strange worlds like the one we see in blood child um and so um you know, these aliens are, as if you recall, Margaret Atwood claims, they're like mirrors to, or sorry, not Margaret Atwood, it was Darko Suvin, but At Atwood agrees in a sense that like when we create these worlds of strangeness, it's like a mirror that helps us to see our own reflections, our own ways of being in the world, right? So um, according to uh, some critics, Butler did not think of herself as a science fiction writer, but more of a chronicler of human heart using science fiction as a tool of revelation. The publishers and the reading public had no trouble looking at Margaret Atwood in that way. Why not Octavia Butler? Because she's a Black woman, right? So like basically Atwood, um, had a lot less of a struggle to become a recognized science fiction writer. And she even calls herself a speculative fiction writer. She, you know, she has some um, gravitas in the literary world. Like people don't read Margaret Atwood just for science fiction kind of thinking. They read her as a high literary figure. And you have to ask, well, why, why is Octavia Butler's name you know, not as recognized as Atwood in many cases, right? That's not true in some cases, like in science fiction circles, Octavia Butler is huge, but in high literature, like great literature, classics, etc., Atwood is up here and Butler is not, right? So th these are the political um, power struggles that we still continue to face. So, um, one of the critics also suggests that maybe Butler was being a little disingenuous. Many of her readers are less science fiction fans and more feminists with a strong African-American contingent. Not surprising, considering the fact that uh, many of Butler's her heroines are strong African-American women. Um, this is not the case in um, Blood Child. Blood Child is quite different. Uh, it's a young boy, right? Um, and judging by the names of the characters, we also feel maybe that they're kind of Asiatic, right? Like Lian, um, Gan, like these are names more from Asia than uh, African American. So Blood Child um, is actually a story from a collection of short stories. Um, and also essays. And, um, you know, it's, it's, I think, one of the finest gems in her uh, oeuvre, in her, you know, the uh, collection of works that she has uh, written down. So let me just ask, because I've been talking a lot, it's already after 530. Uh, what, here are some questions, I don't know why the numbers are off. Um, what was your first reaction to the Click alien got toy before the scene with Lomas. So don't think about the gruesome scene yet. When you first read the description of our crustacean like with many legs, which have sort of hands, um, exoskeleton kind of um, creature, 
Gatoy. How did you feel about it? What were your reactions to it? Yeah, go ahead, Nicholas. I think it, it took me a second to kind of visualize what it was after after the descriptions where they kept kind of describing it as like long and with the multiple arms. But uh, thinking about how it interacted with the human family and how uh, the mother in particular kind of guided her children around it, it felt not overtly, but somehow hostile, like it felt wrong. OK, uh, and I'm not quite sure what it is yet, but something about it was was unpleasant mm -hmm. to me. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, let's take a look. Whoops, at the uh, goodness. I need to really work on cleaning up my desktop. Um, the the text itself, um, it has a lot of. You're right. Slightly sinister insinuations about uh, the alien. Um, sorry, guys. One second. Let me find it. Did I close it down? Please tell me I did not close it down. Oh, I'm reading too much at the same time. Um, this is embarrassing. I just had it open. Remember? Um, no. Sorry. Uh, OK, one second. Okay, there it is. Okay, so Nicholas, let's actually do some close reading because you're right. There's something off in the description. Whoops, of the alien. Um, number one, for example, if you notice the first sentence um, of the story, uh, it sets the tone of the whole text. Um, we can call it a building's Roman or a um growing up story that's the german word for a story that tells something about growing up um so my last night of childhood it's like do you remember the last night you had when you felt like a child and then you woke up as an adult you know like that's weird right that's immediately like what what's going on um this is a narrator who's going to grow up um after this story right so Gatoy's sister had given us two sterile eggs so now we've got this interesting element of what kind of eggs are sterile what is this Gatoy gave one to my mother brother and sisters she insisted that I eat the other one alone it didn't matter there was still enough to leave everyone feeling good almost everyone my mother wouldn't take any she sat watching everyone drifting and dreaming without her most of the time she watched me so the mother number one clue uh refuses to take something from the alien um this is a sign of caution right she's she's uh not accepting something that everybody else seems to enjoy because um apparently the eggs make you feel good Okay, so I lay against Gatoy's long velvet underside, sipping from my egg now and then. So the first thing we get about Gatoy is that she has a velvet underside. That's kind of cozy. I like velvet. I don't know about you, but that sounds like it's nice. Sounds like a good couch, you know. So that's the first little detail, right? Uh, and he wondered why the mother denied herself such a harmless pleasure. Less of her hair would be gray if she indulged now and then. The eggs prolonged life, prolonged vigor. Why would she reject something that gives you a longer life? This is crazy, right? My father, who had never refused one in his life, had lived more than twice as long as she, he should have. And toward the end of his life, when he should have been slowing down, he married my mother and fathered four children. So, I mean, it sounds like from what human expectancy is, is that this guy lived at least until 150 or maybe, maybe even closer to 200 and fathered four children in old age. So clearly these eggs are super eggs. Okay. Oh, and Karamvir, yeah, some kind of caterpillar, I suppose. Um, but uh, with uh, a hard shell on top, though. Um, so let's look at more of the descriptions, right? Um, we know that Gatoy is a thick government official. We also know that um, Gatoy and the mother were friends. 
and that um, basically, you know, that there, there's a friendship, but there's some kind of anger from the mother as well, right? Um, and then there's this sentence too. It was impossible to be formal with her while lying against her and hearing her complain as usual that I was too skinny. Why would Gatsoi care that the boy is too skinny, right? Sets up some interesting foreshadowing. You're better, she said this time, probing me with six or seven of her limbs. This is the first instance where we realize that she's got many, many limbs. And what do they look like, right? So then um, Gatoy lifted her head and perhaps a meter of her body off the couch as though she were sitting up. She looked at my mother and my mother, her face lined and old, turned away. Lien, would, I would like you to have what's left of Gan's egg. The eggs are for the children, my mother said. They are for family. Please take it. Unwillingly obedient, my mother took it from me and put it to her mouth. There were only a few drops left in the now shrunken elastic shell, but she squeezed them out, swallowed them, and after a few moments, some of the lines of tension began to smooth from her face. So clearly the eggs also make you kind of relaxed. It's a sedative. It's some kind of you know, um, uh, drug, I suppose, right? Uh, it, it gives some kind of different feeling. So, um, so there's banter between them two, right? And then we get more details of um, Gatoy's limbs, right? So Gatoy used four of her limbs to push me away from her onto the floor. Go on, Gan, she said. Sit down there with your sisters and enjoy not being sober. Y you had most of the egg. Lien, come warm me. My mother hesitated for no reason that I could see. One of my earliest memories is of my mother stretched alongside Gatoy, talking about things I could not understand, picking me up from the floor and laughing as she sat me on one of Gatoy's segments. She ate her share of eggs then. I wondered when she had stopped and why. So again, we get this, you're right, Nicholas, this mysterious kind of, this thing has many legs, it has a velvet belly, it gives them eggs that makes them drunk. Um, and then basically the mother at some point began to resent this Gatoy, right? Um, and um, again, the descriptions of the limbs, limbs closed around her, you know, Gatoy meant to cage my mother with her limbs, right? Like, imagine this thing is wrapping its... Um, limbs around you and um you know there's a lot a lot going on with every little detail which you can analyze if you want in your essays um that there's a sense of foreboding a sense of something not quite right uh about this family arrangement but Gan keeps saying he remembers, you know, like Gatoy was the first to hold him when he was born. Um, you know, he loves his mom, but he also loves Gatoy. And this is weird, right? Because clearly the mom thinks that Gatoy has something sinister or at least not entirely um, benign about her, right? So when you finally read the whole story, um, to go back to our question, how did you feel about um, Gatoy? Um, as the story uh, unraveled and you find out that Gatoy wants to impregnate Gan, um, you know, what aspects of this made you uncomfortable? Um, you know, can you describe what made you feel uneasy or maybe disgusted or what, what kind of uh, strange things did you find in the story that made you go, huh? <laughs> and maybe gave you some interesting thoughts even after you stopped reading the story. So I'm looking for more feedback on how, how did this make you think of relationships, pregnancy, having babies, having a family, choosing to be with someone and, you know, when you know that it's going to cause you pain yeah nicholas go ahead uh it wasn't so much the the pregnancy thing that was weird to me but the 
uh, the dynamic between Gon and Gatoy. Like Gatoy is a is a predator, right? Like he's she's grooming Gon to kind of give birth, and and I just from my perspective, a lot of the time when uh, she makes a big effort to emphasis on it being Gon's choice, but yeah. Gon has been raised for this role, right? Yeah. And she, and he's put in a, in a situation in which it he he can't really make uh, an informed decision or, or a rational decision because he doesn't know. One doesn't know better, and two, he doesn't have a better option, right? So it, it feels like, uh, I guess, the, the the physical cage that that Goy puts around uh, right. the people there is kind of is uh, it applies to the relationship as well. I think. Excellent, thank you. So the question that I'm writing down in my notebook right now, based on what you said, is how much is it Gan's choice to make a free choice, right? Um, and Part of, I'll skip to um, the afterword. I hope you read the afterword of the story um, because essentially, you know, Butler says that this story is very much about what um, it felt like to be a woman for many, many centuries before women were given a choice let's say to have contraceptives or choose not to have babies um so she says number one that she believes blood child is not a story of slavery um because to her it's more of a kind of strange but still love story between two very different beings and also a coming of age as i said story in which a boy must absorb disturbing information and use it to make a decision that will affect the rest of his life uh, it's also a pregnant man's story and um you know she asks could i write a story in which a man chose to become pregnant not through some sort of misplaced competitiveness to prove that a man could do anything a woman could do not because he was forced to not even out of curiosity I wanted to see whether I could write a dramatic story of a man becoming pregnant as an act of love, choosing pregnancy in spite of, as well as because of surrounding difficulties. Um, and, um, you know, she also had that inspiration about insects laying eggs and human skin, which gave her the idea of the, the alien creature. Um, but essentially, a lot of critics see the story as a commentary on the fact that especially before modern medicine and contraceptives and also rules about legal age to have sexual relations to get married etc right like 40 50 year old men would marry 14 year old girls and have babies with them and this is not so different what she's describing right because gone based on his description is probably like 14 or something like that uh, in the story. We hope he's at least 14. Um, and he's been groomed, as you said correctly, to believe that Gatoy means well. So he loves her because he's been held by her since he was born, which again, same kind of idea that, you know, um, there was a practice of young brides in many cultures you know so a man who would have seen the girl born you know and be in a cradle would later marry her etc so this is this is commentary on human practice you know the, so this is why um it could feel so disturbing because it's strangely familiar right um so then um if it's it's the concept of the fact that Gon doesn't actually have much of a choice, uh, it's not so much, you know, the, uh, well, we'll get to the C-section and all that uh, in a moment. It's, it's more about choice and freedom and uh, the ability to decide. I mean, there is a moment in the story where he has a gun and he could shoot a toy, right? Um, but I suppose the rest of the society if Gatoy, a high-ranking politician in her community of aliens, gets killed, I'm pretty sure Gatoy will doom his entire family to death. So once again, is it much of a choice, right? 
where are they going to run? They're on a different planet and all the humans are slaves, sort of, but they're not because they're part of families with aliens, right? So the story is complex that way. They're like no simple answers whatsoever. And um, I think that's one of the most uh, challenging parts of trying to understand how we can discover ways of thinking about relationships and the governments that sanction relationships to this day that you know we try to pretend like romantic love is full of just um personal freedom and choice but there are a lot of things that constrict our choices including racism for example sadly in toronto i know a young woman well, we grew up together in Toronto, whose parents basically um, disowned her when she married a black guy, right? Like this is still an issue. And that's why I think Butler's story makes us pause and say, yeah, how do we make decisions about our relationships? How do we make decisions about having children um, and raising them in a particular way, you know? Because, um, gun is raised in a way that accepts difference right and that's that's the positive aspect of the story he actually does genuinely love gatoy according to his own narrative but he also feels some restrictions on what he can and cannot do right um so anyway i'll let us move on to the next question, but it's it's a difficult, difficult story, you know, which is why we're kind of looking at it last out of all the stories so far. And then it's going to get even more complicated with AI and Clara and the Sun. Okay, so what parallels can we draw between the Thlick, uh, Terran relationship? So the Thlick are the aliens, Terran is the word for humans because they're from Terra, from Earth. Um, in the story and the human animal relationship uh, of or in our lives, I guess just in our lives. So Flick and humans, animals and humans or humans and animals, are there any parallels you see interesting to discuss? You know, how do humans treat um, animals compared to how Flick treat humans? Here's my little Oh, come here. Oh my goodness. Jesus, you got heavy. Here's my dog. I can choose if she reproduces or not. She's still not fixed. Um, she's a beautiful, yet kind of smallish King Charles. And she was rejected to be bred, which is why I ended up getting her um, from a shelter. So, you know, Breeders thought she's not standard. She's not pretty enough. Her legs are crooked. Her teeth are crooked. Um, so how do humans treat animals? How do we, do we see anything about the kind of alien human relationship there that reminds us of this kind of pragmatic, uh, self-interested um, relationship with animals that we have on earth today? Or maybe you don't don't see that connection. But for me, it's a bit, you know, the way that the aliens reproduce. Like, what's do you remember? What's the logic? Why do the Tlik start reproducing with the humans? Why do they want us to be uh, carriers of their babies? Do you remember the logic? No? <laughs> OK, I'll answer my question. Uh, the Tlick seem to have, oh, wait, there is a comment. Yeah, the humans, um, the bodies are more um, hospitable more i guess maybe even just because of the mammal kind of um uh, uh biology more babies of the aliens can survive in in a human body that's why they uh colonized us 
But there's also another interesting um, sinister aspect. Is it the male or the female body that's better for carrying the plague babies? Do you remember? Is it men or women who are the preferred hosts, technically, biologically? Yeah, women are preferred because the female body is designed for baby carrying, but uh, why do the Tlik want to use men instead of women to reproduce? I know I'm bombarding you with questions, but I just want to hear your thoughts on the logic of the story. So Gan is being used, not his sister, sisters. Why? The women are used for something else. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you so much for your participation. They want the human females to reproduce more, to have more, exactly, kind of breeding livestock. There you go. Thank you. So there's the animal connection. So the humans are a little bit like livestock for the Blick, but they've created this kind of more humane program where instead of just grabbing any random human and forcing themselves upon them. Instead, they actually create families where Gatoy is like the matriarch of the family. And she grooms, as Nicholas said, the male that she's chosen to be the carrier of her babies to love her, right? Like he, he is raised to have affection for her. And so then that's why the mother is so resentful just to cut to the chase right she she appreciates the fact that gatoy has allowed her family to have four healthy children and you know and they're protected and they're in relatively good conditions they have food they have a home they have safety but um her youngest son is going to have to go through what she knows is horrible or at least, you know, difficult. So anyway, so then um, there's this commentary that the story offers on this kind of unfair relationship. And we can draw parallels on male-female relationships in our zero world, in our reality. Um, and here's a quick overview of critical interpretations. I'll go through this quickly. Uh, you can read the full article if you want to look it up in journals. Axtell uh, James is the name of this um, uh, of the author of this article called Feminist Reading of Octavia Butler's Blood Child from uh, 10 years ago. So uh, James Axtell argues that the parasite keeps the humans captive on a preserve on a foreign planet for the purpose of hosting its eggs and delivering its young. And the reaction of the reader is to recoil in terror and indignation at the injustice. Yet, he argues, this scenario is not that different from traditional gender roles in human gestation and childbirth. The Tlik are in the position of physical and political power, but they cannot have children without the Terran. Men are more powerful physically and politically than women, yet they need women to bear their children. If the reader is able to make the logical connection of the allegory presented in Blood Child to human gender roles, gestation and childbirth, then Butler has accomplished the purpose in achieving a completely new perspective on a familiar theme. And more importantly, this is what I find really fascinating in Axtell's argument, um, is that he writes, the child can be seen as a parasite to the mother. Butler removes the romance and eroticism uh, from reproduction foregrounding the issues of gender roles in childbirth. Uh, for example, the Tlick eggs are an opiate, just like an idea of motherhood to many women. And it's actually true that um, there's a hormone that gets released uh, when uh, a woman, I believe, is both pregnant, but also immediately after um, 
childbirth. Uh, there's a release of hormones that creates this feeling of love. You know, the reason the mother will stay up all night and make sure the baby is safe and breastfeed and all that is because there's a release of positive emotion. It's like a high, really. I've experienced it. And you get and you get and you get this beautiful feeling of like, oh my God, life is so beautiful, right? Um, this is genetically programmed as far as we understand in the human condition that in order for us to protect our young we get super happy super excited just at the sight and the smell and the experience of holding your infant okay so the eggs are in the story kind of that you know that uh, uh they have that function um they allow the humans to feel like uh life is uh really um wonderful when they consume these eggs so axel says the narrative foregrounds the fact that women carry an unfair physical and emotional burden compared to men in childbirth yet women are still marginalized by gender roles defined by patriarchy and this is the fact i find fascinating at least in north america as far as i understand based on this statistic 30 percent of all babies being delivered are delivered by cesarean section um so the scenario of cutting the host open to allow the birth of the parasite child is not that different from a medical standpoint that many contemporary human births currently experience, okay? So you might find this far-fetched, but I have to say as a mother of two, um, I find this a compelling argument, um, in particular because uh, there is a really interesting tendency to jump to C-sections uh, as, as a way uh, of a safer delivery, at least in North America, as I said, I don't know the statistics around the world. Um, I like out of my friends, pretty much everybody else had C-sections. And also um, it is a, um, it's a procedure that is, uh, I don't know, how true this is, but among celebrities, there was actually a movement, um, at least maybe a decade ago, where celebrities felt like it was the royal birth, uh, like Caesar, King Caesar was born this way. And so uh, I believe Posh Spice, Beckham's wife, coined something like too posh to push. Um, I don't know. I, I read this somewhere, but the point is there's like an interesting dynamic in human society where C-sections are pretty common. 30% is a lot, I think. Um, and, um, and so the opening of the belly, the way we see in the story is not so uncommon in the human world. So why is it so disturbing when we're thinking about the scene in the story? Well, perhaps because they're not human babies, they're grubs, right? And there's a whole other um, can of worms, <laughs> if you will. Sorry for the cheesy joke um, that we could um, talk about. But basically, you know, this is how science fiction explores this kind of relationship between females and males, and, you know, uh, the body as a host for parasites. And of course, um, uh, there's also the backstory that uh, Gan's brother uh, is terrified of being chosen for the role of being the father of Gatoy's uh, children because uh, he saw a C-section uh, accidentally in a forest, right? So um, final thoughts, I promise, and then we're going to talk about other things. Um, the relationship between the humans and the insects in the story um, is uh, a kind of a metaphor about the dissimilarities between men and women. Um, we're going to start thinking about um, humanity versus artificial intelligence and whether um, our condition as humans actually uh, is so radically different from other creatures um, in our next section of the course. But basically, um, stories like Blood Child challenge uh, our social codes, our social mores, our values, um, 
And, you know, this story shows that two very dissimilar beings can coexist in a peaceful symbi symbiotic relationship uh, for the survival of both. Um, and if blood child fails, it's in the reader's inability to accept the existence of such a sym symbiotic relationship, despite the serious power disparity between the two. But again, the disparity of power, this is something we still continue to live with. There is a lot of sexism and racism uh, and homophobia and all kinds of um, discrimination that still exists on our planet. So how this is particularly different is not clear if you really think about it, right? Okay, um, so thoughts on this interpretation of blood child that basically it's a metaphor for traditional gender roles in human gestation and childbirth. That's what one critic suggests this story is about. Do you buy it? Do you like it? Do you hate it? What do you think? It is 10 after six. If you guys don't want to talk, I'll just keep talking. <laughs> because um, I have two more things I want to do. One is introducing our novel, Clara and the Sun, and giving you some reading questions to think about over the reading break, because I recommend you finish the first whole section of Clara and the Sun over the reading break, where you get to meet her, learn about her, and then she meets a child who's going to purchase her. Okay, um, just a quick background about uh, Clara and the Sun. Um, and actually, I read uh, a couple of articles yesterday and today that added to my understanding of um, where Ishiguro is coming from uh, with this story. Well, first of all, about a month ago, there was an interview where um, Ishiguro described this novel, Clara and the Sun, as... Um, a story he wanted to write for children about uh, like a companion that is designed to be your artificial friend, right? His um, uh, daughter, Naomi uh, Ishiguro, uh, she told him it's a bad idea because the idea of uh, Clara, as he imagined, is quite sad. Um, she is not mm, someone that I think um i hope that our relationship with ai will be different in the future so anyway so his daughter said no dad no you can't write this for children this cannot be a book for children so he wrote it for adults um no kushi uh, thank you for the question the novel's not available on blackboard i told you guys from the very first lecture that it's a book you have to buy you can buy it on amazon for very very cheap a hard copy costs only like 23 dollars. it's the only thing you'll be purchasing in this course or you can buy a kindle edition which is even cheaper um there's an audiobook as well it's very well read but then you don't have the text in front of you so i recommend a printed copy amazon has a ton of copies 23 dollars for a hard copy is very very cheap it's very well made you know i i recommend it um but um yeah so the novel um is uh written for adults um, but the idea is really fascinating because I think it's also maybe a novel that could be really good for teenagers because Clara is designed to help teenagers to not be lonely. Um, and um, she is uh, powered by solar power. So the novel's significance revolves around the sun as nourishment. Um, it's also a lot about emotional intelligence. Um, and uh, again, I'm giving you uh, three discussion questions for when we come back after the reading break. Um, think about what uh, kind of emotional intelligence uh, Clara is capable of uh, and how it develops as she continues to observe her world. Um, and then we're going to connect our... Um, 
uh, other readings to this novel. So for example, you know, clones or androids, are they actually full persons? Uh, are we gonna talk about, again, ideas of, you know, what constitutes a person? Does it, you know, require a theory of a soul or not? Um, can Clara potentially be the same as a human person? Okay, because you'll see that she develops so much. Um, she's actually a really interesting and compelling character. Um, probably the most um, kind and benign uh, AI that I've encountered in science fiction, other than Data, but Data had some dark moments, I think, whereas Clara is just, well, not to ruin anything, she's just just pure good she's so wonderful but at the same time she's living in a dystopian world of a lot of um inequality injustice and anger so she's designed to probably help children grow up to be not so damaged in a world of injustice okay that's all i'll say um it's a beautiful novel it was only published a year ago um so please start reading it and this is going to be a focal kind of culmination of the course's ideas on uh, what science fiction can help us do, um, uh, you know, as species with uh, imagining a different kind of um, world. So a couple of quotes from some of the articles that I read um, thinking about uh, Ishiguro's work. Um, so, yeah, so she um, navigates a fictional universe um, that uh, is not very different from ours. For example, quote, people endlessly stare at or press their hand-handled hand, hand oblongs, which are like tablets, um, where adults are somehow stratified by their clothes. For example, the mother of the girl who purchases Clara was an office worker and quote from her shoes and suit we could tell she was high ranking um, and one of the key aspects of the story is that um, uh, it, quote in this colorless ruthless place children are fatalistically sorted into losers and winners and the latter who are known as lifted are, uh, whose parents decided to go ahead with them are designated, sorry, destined for elite colleges and bright futures. Lifted is a term for uh, genetic modification. So in this world where Clara uh, is designed, um, children, uh, the parents of the children are given the opportunity to give them genetic modification, which enhances their intelligence. Um, but then the problem with that is that some of them get sick, okay? So, so there's a lot going on in this novel. So we're going to talk about intelligence, emotional intelligence, uh, eugenics, um, social inequality, friendship, loneliness, all kinds of stuff, okay? Um, I think I won't quote much more not to ruin anything for you. I want you to read it and enjoy it. But um, finally for today, um, I know you still will have to write your essay one, the final version. Um, you can have until the weekend to finish it. You know, Friday is the deadline, but Saturday, Sunday, don't email me for one day extensions. Okay, just take it and send it in. Um, but essay two will be um, a culmination of your ideas in the course. It will have to rely on at least two secondary sources from peer reviewed journals. I'll, go, I'll show you some examples today. And it must be at least a thousand words, but no more than 1250, please. And uh, APA is a uh, college standard, but you can use MLA if it's more uh, familiar to you to cite your sources. So um, the topics, I won't go thoroughly through them today because I think we need to um, uh, have you read a little bit more and talk about uh, Clara and the Sun in our next live class before we really um, uh delve into trying to research for the essays but i'll give you some tips on research right now um name of the novel yeah of course it's actually posted on our course story sahar it's called clara and the sun kazuo ishiguro 
is the Ishiguro is the uh, last name of the um, author. You're welcome. Um, so basically, uh, the topics will be posted. This will all be posted um, on Blackboard. Um, another thing you should know is that um, there will be one more article we'll be reading in the final weeks of the course uh, by Bruce Sterling, which is from the 90s, and he talks about video games. So if you're going to want to write a final research essay on science fiction video games, that's an option, just to let you know, because I always have students who, you know, are gamers and they want to say something about science fiction video games. That's totally cool. Um, Instructions for essay one are under uh, assignment, Karam Uh It's all in the lecture slides and also the outline um, instructions. Okay, so finally, I want to show you a couple of things. Oops, why did that happen? Okay, uh, a couple of things that um, were of concern to me, um, whoops. Uh, in the essay outlines. So for example, uh, here is uh, an originality report that I use to look at an essay outline. And um, you don't see this because I don't want the name to appear. But when I look at somebody's um, essay outline, um, I can see a report of anything that was found online that's the same. So I can give you examples of um, you know, sources that were used uh, and not cited. Okay, and if that's you, just learn and move on. Don't um, don't be upset about it. But uh, whoops, sorry, that's not it. Uh, yeah, right there. Science fiction is the most important literature in the history of the world because it's the history of ideas, the history of our civilization, birthing itself. If that's Ray Bradbury's words, famous science fiction writer, you can't just put that into your essay and not put quotation marks around it, and not give me the reference website where you got it, okay? Citations are essential uh, because if somebody takes other people's words and presents them as their own, it's the same as stealing it's called intellectual property, right? So for example, you know, if you Google um, the essay or the major research paper I wrote when I finished my master's, um, it's published on an official website of the author whose work I wrote about. Um, I spent an entire summer writing it, it's 50 pages. And if you take sentences from that work and put it somewhere and publish it, you stole from me. <laughs> and I'd be pretty upset. And let's say you have published work and I went and took something from it, um, I would be stealing from you. So plagiarism is stealing. Um, it's also misrepresenting um, what your work is. Um, so we need to make sure we cite and citing is not so difficult. I'm going to um, open up uh, a citing machine um, that I want you to look at as a tool, okay? Um, citation is something that um, Seneca College actually offers workshops on through the library. So you can always take um, a workshop and learn more about it because this is an elective course, uh, which presumes that you finished either Calm 101 or English 106, which teach you all about citation. This is not really part of the course's um, uh, core learning outcomes, you're, uh, we, Seneca, are assuming that you know how to cite. So there is no excuse for plagiarism, just please. Um, uh, and um, Kushi, the novel is the last fictional text we're reading, and then there's just one more article, and that's it. Yeah, so you're more than, well, you're halfway through the readings, yeah. Um, well, Amida, you should read Clara and the Sun. I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, for the first essay, you don't need it. But for the second essay, it's a choice for the topics. Um, and it's also something that we're going to have a quiz on. So yeah, you should read it. Um, it's a really good book. I think you're going to enjoy it a lot. It's very current, right? It was written just last year, uh, or published, I should say, just a year ago. Um, 
And uh, Ishiguro is one of the cutting edge kind of science fiction writers today. So I think that it's really worth your time. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, this cool tool called Citation Machine. And the only downside to this website is that it makes you watch commercials unless you want to pay for it. OK, but here's the point. Look, if you used a website where you took a quote, you click website. Right. Then you go back to the website. And whoops, and you copy the URL. And then you go back to the citation machine. Sorry, guys, computer lagging. Sorry, guys, it's lagging, but we can't find the name of the author. So we're going to say mission. dot org okay so we have all the other information filled in i'm going to complete the citation and again as i said if you want to pay ten dollars a month for this silly service that you can basically avoid using if you know the citation procedure but if you want the machine to do it for you you have to watch commercials or pay ten dollars a month i recommend you don't pay ten dollars a month you can spend that much better in my, many better ways. Um, okay, so the ad is going to play. And then the meantime, okay. as I mentioned, um, Clara and the Sun is our major novel study. Um, Part one uh, focuses on constructions of subjectivity. Like, how do you know you're a person? How does Clara know she's a person? Is she a person, etc.? So the novel will uh, take you through um, Clara's ability to perceive. So when we come back after the reading week, um, I want you to um, list characteristics or traits that Clara possesses. For example, uh, when we read Helen O'Loy, she was both loyal, but also hysterical. Okay, so try to think of ways of describing Clara when you um, read the first part of the novel. Okay, our citation is ready. Um, so the citation I copy, and if I'm writing an essay, okay, I'm going to, here's my, for example, ooh, I don't know. Do I want to show this to you? Uh, this is my proposal uh, for my PhD. Um, and uh, this is something that um, is very, very uh, rough right now because it's for exams. But basically, I wrote um, a proposal that talks about Clara and the Sun. And then I talk about the different theoretical models that I want to use to basically talk about key concepts like artificial intelligence, uh, aesthetic judgment, biopower, constructions of selfhood, teleology, which means uh, purpose in life, mechanization, plasticity and insubordination, etc. But you see the citations? So these are my citations. This is everything that I'm going to look at. And so, as I said, the machine, the citation machine can actually uh give you the possibility uh to just put the citation into your uh work cited list does that make sense so when you write your essay you quote something you put in brackets the author's name when you finish the essay you have to list all the sources that you referenced this is 
basic expectations. Um, as I said, there's a lesson on citations that I have pre-recorded, which I'll share with you and you can watch that if you feel like this is something quite uh, unfamiliar to you. It shouldn't be because there's a course you should have taken that taught you that. But if you miss something, that's fine. Um, we're going to uh, go over it again for a research essay. So uh, the final thoughts for today is that um, I really, really hope you uh, read at least the first uh, part of uh, Clara and the Sun. They're in parts. Okay, so there are no chapters. So part one, I forget, it's about 30 or 40 pages. Um, and then uh, when you come back, I want you to answer these discussion questions so that we get to talk about um, the way that the world that Ishiguro constructs with these artificial friends or AFs uh, is uh, similar or different to our world. Um, yeah, thank you for reminding me, Karam viewers. So the midterm, I didn't notice plagiarism in, in midterms, I believe, if I remember correctly. I mean, if you just relied on your own um, ideas uh, overall, then you got your uh, full marks. Um, the only problem with the midterms was sometimes that uh, the uh, short answer questions were not very full, not very developed. Uh, most of you got the multiple choice questions right, most of them. So most people got good grades on the midterm. It was good to see that you guys are reading. So, um, okay, it's after 6.30. Um, any final questions, any thoughts? And if not, um, I wish you a really restful reading week. And uh, I think Clara and the Sun will be a good companion uh, book for you. Um, I think it's super fun. I think it's written in a way that's really um, uh, engaging for today's world. Uh, so the first essay, okay, this Friday um, uh, is... Uh, the 24th, but you can have until uh, June 26th, okay? So I'll set it to be June 24th, just as, you know, motivation date, but if you need a day or two to uh, finish it, uh, don't email me, just take an extension of a day or two, okay? Okay, Ron, stay, uh, stay back to... Uh, talk to me. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody else. Have a good night. Uh, talk to you soon.